Computer programs can calculate our intelligence, our blood pressure, and our heart rate. But can computers calculate our future? The digital revolution opens up new possibilities. Almost everything we now do is recorded and stored. But do our digital footprints really represent who we are? And if they do, can they be used to tell our future? We're in the midst of a revolution, whether we like it or not. It's called Big Data. In 2013 alone, we produced more data than in the entire history of mankind. Almost four and a half billion terabytes. Since then, we've been producing a further two and a half million terabytes every day. With our smartphones, we constantly generate data about ourselves and our environment. The sensors and cameras in our smartphones, vehicles and computers record where we are and what we do. This data explosion changes the way we live our lives. Text, photographs, sounds, even odors, everything can now be translated into numbers. So, have our whole lives become computable? Our two directors, Pina and Jacob, want to find out. Scientists search for patterns in the data we produce to calculate the future from the past. This is called predictive analytics. Can they tell our personal future by looking at our data? Pina and Jacob meet two specialists for predictive analytics. Computer experts from the German Fraunhofer Institute and Bonn University have set up a special experiment for us. For two months, Pina and Jacob would allow these total strangers full access to their smartphone data. A special smartphone app transmits all their data to Georg Fuchs and Alexander Markovitz. These scientists know nothing about Pina and Jacob, yet they hope to construct an accurate model of their lives and their behavior. We want to find patterns like when and where are you? Who do you call regularly? When do you send a text message? To whom? We can see what apps you use and when. We will look at regular patterns to describe your typical behavior and then predict your future behavior from it. We look for these regular patterns. That's a real challenge for us because you travel so much. We really want to see what we can find out. I think it would be cool to discover habits that even you yourselves don't know about. Some you may be proud of, others less so. I'm not talking about big things, but stuff that makes you think, hey, if I'd stop doing that, I might become a better person. Pina and Jacob have mixed feelings about this experiment. From now on, complete strangers have intimate access to their lives. Apart from their smartphones, they will use a Google Glass. This wearable computer will constantly record what they see. If such smart glasses become part of our everyday lives, the amount of data we produce will increase even further. For this project, Jacob will travel to the US, while Pina will stay in Europe. Their data will be analyzed by so-called algorithms. Algorithms are procedures to solve a specific problem. A simple example of an algorithm is a cooking recipe, for example, for making a burger. 
By exactly following the instructions, you always get the same burger in the end. For more complex tasks, there are intelligent algorithms that are able to learn. They can automatically detect new parameters. For example, that on Saturdays, fewer burgers are sold, but more fries. While Pina remains in Europe, Jacob travels to the United States. The first stop on his tour is California. Silicon Valley near San Francisco is the birthplace of predictive analytics. Here, even the police use it to fight crimes before they're committed. Since July 2011, the Santa Cruz police force uses a computer program called PredPol, which stands for Predictive Policing. It's able to predict the time and the location of a future crime. And just so you guys know, uh, the, the big thing flaring up for us right now is the Harvey West area. We're going to try to toss some overtime at it uh, for nighttime hours, you know, as soon as the sun starts to go down. There they are, flooding the area. So it's reflected here. In fact, if you, you take a look up at the prep hole map, we're showing bergs for the Harvey West area. So there you go. In California, the police are under pressure. The state is cash-strapped. Public spending has been reduced. Break-ins, car thefts, and robberies are increasing. The solution here in Santa Cruz, let the computer decide which neighborhoods to patrol. The program was developed here at Santa Clara University, south of San Francisco. Computer specialist George Moeller is one of the pioneers of predictive policing. The algorithm was always better. It was always two to three times more accurate than the human analyst at predicting where crime is going to happen. The data that the algorithms use is past crime data. So we take the past five to 10 years of crime reports from a police database and we pull it in. We look at the locations, the times, crime types, whether a gun was used. Uh, we pull all that information in um, and then we run these algorithms each day and get a new set of predictions for tomorrow for officers uh, in the field to use to determine where to patrol. The police's resources must be used effectively. Santa Cruz, Charlie, 113, I'll be out with 184. Every officer focuses on three or four critical areas. Can you send two people that, please? Redpole predicts that the risk of a crime being committed is particularly high in certain hotspots at a certain time. Our, uh, our hotspot map for today. Let's see if we can pull that up here real quick. One of the things that I can do here with, with Predpol is I can actually point on one of these boxes and it will show me what that area looks like. We're definitely going to get out into the Harvey West area up here and then we're also going to get down towards the beach and look at some, uh, looks, look at some of our vulnerable areas here down along our beach. The algorithm searches for specific patterns in existing crime data to predict the crime hotspots. There's been a lot of research that shows that certain types of crime are contagious. They spread like a virus. So in the case of gang violence, what you'll have is a ga one gang will attack another gang, and that second gang will retaliate a few days later. So you'll see clusters or series of gang crimes that are contagious because the, once you have that initial event, it increases the likelihood for more violent events. Santa Cruz, Charlie, 113, I'll be out with 184. Criminal gangs commit most of the crimes in Santa Cruz, particularly violent crimes and drug offenses. In one of Predpol's hotspots, our patrol actually finds a known gang member. They keep a close eye on him. Yes, 
especially well-seasoned, experienced officers. Uh, they're telling me, there's no way this thing can predict crime in this neighborhood better than I can. I have all this experience. And so, it, you know, there was a lot of skepticism. But Steve Clark knows the statistics prove him right. If she was going to contact that guy, he's, he's been known to be a little dangerous, so we were going to stick around for that. So. And 2013, for the first five months of the year, our crime statistics were, had increased 42% for auto thefts. So we were 42% up, and I took a team, I sent them out there using PredPol, and I says, you guys need to go work this, impact auto thefts in these areas, and we did that. We ended the year reduced by 15%. So we went from being up 42% to minus 15%, a huge swing in crime. A safer city, thanks to computers controlling the criminals. Preventing crimes before they're actually committed sounds like a good idea. No wonder that other researchers are looking into it too. For instance, at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mathematician Cynthia Rudin too wants to predict crimes using algorithms and big data. However, her approach is slightly different from the one employed by the researchers in California. So Series Finder detects patterns. So if you can see a pattern, you know something about where it's going in the future. So for, for instance, if you know that a particular criminal has an affinity for a particular location and a particular time, you can send someone there to potentially do something about that person continuing the pattern. Searching for behavioral patterns and thereby predicting possible crimes is not a new idea. Criminal analysts have been trying to do this for decades, but the software has a crucial advantage. The good thing about a computer program is it never gets tired. <laughs> it just can run in the background, you know, and, and just pop up things that a human can look at manually. Right, and they had a lot of things in common. The Cambridge Police Department plan to use Pattern Finder soon for their daily work. You know, sort of run in the background, and you wouldn't know about it. So but unlike really the system in Santa Cruz, the program doesn't yet run in real time. It has yet to prove its predictive power in reality. When we start to understand crime patterns better and better, will it then be possible to identify a perpetrator even before he's committed a crime? like in the movie Minority Report. What we're predicting is that there's a human behind several crimes at once, and that human is going to commit a crime again. This isn't Minority Report. You're not going to say that, um, you know, someone who's never committed a crime is going to commit a crime in this house tomorrow. That's not what it's about. It's about finding a pattern that already exists and assuming it's going to continue on into the future. Jacob is quite impressed by what he has seen and heard. Nevertheless, he, just like Pina, has an uneasy feeling about computers planning police operations. Evgeny Morosov shares these concerns. Pina meets the renowned internet critic in Berlin. The underlying philosophy behind most of the systems that rely on predictive analytics and some kind of you know, mechanism for eliminating the problem bef before it happens, whether it's in health or whether it's in crime or whether it's in a, any other social domain, I mean, the underlying assumption there is that the current setup is perfect. Right? So, uh, I mean, I don't think that the current setup is perfect in any of those domains, and I don't accept philosophically that that would ever be the case. Algorithms can only find patterns and compute accurate forecasts if they're fed with large amounts of reliable data, just like in our experiment. Jacob and Pina's first sets of data are being sent to Georg Fuchs and Alexander Markovitz. Although the information is still raw and chaotic, Jacob and Pina have to get used to the idea 
that their behavior is far less individual than they would like to think. Jedes Handyverhalten von jedem Nutzer ist anders als das von einem anderen. Aber innerhalb unseres Verhaltens The mobile phone behavior of each user is different. But within our behavior patterns, we're pretty predictable. We're not this homo economicus making great smart decisions. Free will explains only a small part of our behavior. The rest is made up of habits that occur in patterns. We can predict all that. And this is computer science's great insult to humanity. Jacob is unique, and so is Pina. But in what they like or do, they resemble thousands of others. Therefore, retailers use predictive analytics to forecast consumer behavior. Because our seemingly unique biographies are not so unique when compared to others. Certain patterns appear again and again. The algorithms of retail companies search for exactly these patterns in the data sets we produce on a daily basis. For example, which products do women buy in the third month of pregnancy? Once the algorithm has learned what the pregnancy pattern looks like, it starts searching for it in the customer's data. In the end, the algorithm can predict pregnancy with an accuracy of more than 95% and send out brochures for nappies and baby food. Big data is only possible because of the digitization of society. We have so much data because lots of our actions take place in the digital domain and are automatically recorded. That's true for our purchasing habits, our travel habits, our social habits, and all of our communication. And you can examine this huge part of our lives for free. Of all data guzzlers, no one is watching us more closely than Google. Jacob is on his way to the Internet Giant's headquarters in Mountain View, California. Google was the first company to systematically collect and analyze Internet data. Since its creation in 1998, the company has saved all search queries. Google's algorithms and methods of analysis are considered the best. For months, Jacob has been trying to get an interview, but with little success. Google knows a lot more about us than we know about them. We wanted to know more about Google Flu Trends, one of the applications for predictive analytics. Google counts the frequency of specific search terms and, similar to a weather forecast, makes predictions about where and when a flu epidemic will occur. However, scientists criticize that the company connects advertising to search queries and thus distorts the data. Pina is traveling to Zurich. Here, researchers use a completely different approach to predicting epidemics. Dirk Helbing heads the research group at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He also wants to fight future epidemics before they happen, by making predictions about where and when exactly the next outbreak will occur. Infections start in one city and then move to the next. This allows us to stock up on medical supplies in these places and therefore successfully combat the spread of these diseases. In the past, infected people moved slowly from place to place. This resulted in uniform circular and wave-like propagation patterns of epidemics like the plague. But today, things are different. But if you look at modern disease propagation patterns, then they look pretty chaotic. Suddenly people are sick in America, then in Europe, then in Asia, and it's quite a mess. The reason is that today, diseases are primarily spread by air passengers. The result is a global network of cities that are closely linked by air traffic. 
Dirk Helbing calls this new approach to measuring distance effective distance. For example, the distance between big cities such as Frankfurt and New York is effectively smaller than the distance between New York and rural Pennsylvania. Dirk Helbing's algorithm analyzes the propagation pattern by looking at individual airports. Suddenly, the apparent chaos turns into something surprisingly regular. At some airports, the propagation pattern looks nearly circular. And this tells us the most likely origin of the disease. Once you have this information, you can also make predictions. So if you want to protect yourself from flu in New York, you might have to watch Frankfurt more closely than Pennsylvania. Jacob is on his way to San Francisco to find out more about the latest health trends. a Misfit Shine, a Fitbit Flex, a Nike Fuel Band, a Jawbone Up, a Basis Watch, two more Shines, a Pebble, another Shine on my necklace, a Basis, four more Shines, a Meta Watch, Fitbit Ultra, a Fitbug, a Vizamzi, a Fitbit Zip, a Fitbit One, a Strive Play, a Why Things Pulse, four more Shines, and I have an Android and an iOS device. Rachel Kalmar not only uses these devices, she helps to develop them too. One of the things I'm interested in is early detection of disease. So for instance, how far back do you have to go in time to be able to predict, say, onset of a neurodegenerative disorder? And can you find traces of that in people's activity patterns? And being able to take these kinds of uh, sets of data and once we have a better understanding of how they relate to health, disease, to behavior, then we're also going to be able to build better predictive models that are going to lead to uh, better early diagnoses of preventable diseases. She also tries to find ways of preventing depression. One device that I think could be really cool would be something like a mood ring that measures how much exposure to different light you have, and then it could automatically adjust the lighting in your house to compensate. Then this could increase the quality of life for myself as well as other people. Using self-tracking to improve your health sounds great. Pina puts a few of these devices to the test and realizes logging all the data takes a lot of time. Oh. <laughs> Up to now, self-trackers haven't been taken seriously. But what if recording vital values becomes a prerequisite for health insurance? The idea is that if you monitor yourself enough, or often enough, you won't even need to go to the doctor, right? So the idea then, if you push that idea to its ultimate conclusions, is that if you do not monitor yourself enough, often enough, or, you know, with enough gadgets, uh, there is something wrong with you as a citizen. Until now, self-trackers only log physical data, such as running distance, heart rate, or sleep patterns. But a new research project also targets the psyche. Now a new smartphone app is supposedly able to predict depression. There are several parameters that change during depression. First, the communication pattern, then the movement pattern, and the third is perhaps the most interesting. The tone of voice changes during depression. A very highly modulated voice melody changes to a very quiet, uniform, unmodulated melody. The Depression app, which is still a prototype, will soon be able to record communication behavior, voice melody, and the movement pattern of a patient. It's an early warning system, not only for patients and doctors.
Healthy people who have absolutely no psychiatric disorders have a natural mechanism to deal with stress. But if they're exposed to too much stress, it's quite possible that their behavior could change. Pina will test the app for two months. By analyzing her communication and movement patterns, Thomas Schliefer wants to predict how big her risk is for developing a depression. I must warn you, this will reveal a great deal about your behavior and how you deal with stress. It might show that you handle stress not quite as well as you think, and we will see this. And we might predict that you're likely to develop a depressive disorder, like a burnout syndrome, or even full-blown depression. None of the previous applications of predictive analytics have interfered so deeply with our personal lives. How reliable are the app's predictions? How is Pina going to deal with the outcome? And who else, apart from the doctor, will see her data? Virtuality poses new questions, like, what information should I be allowed to collect from you? Who's going to have access to it and why? My computer model of you is 95% accurate. Is that good enough? And can I share this with everyone? These are fundamental issues. What makes a person a person? And what should I be allowed to do with big data and what not? In the meantime, our prediction experiment continues. By now, Georg Fuchs and Alexander Markovets have collected a significant amount of data. The scientists analyze the quality of the data and start looking for patterns that will allow them to make predictions about Jacob's and Pina's behavior. But especially Jacob's restless lifestyle makes life hard for the experts. This is astounding, yeah? yeah. Super. It's not only scientists who are excited about the possibility of telling the future with computer models. Predictive analytics has become big business. In San Francisco, Jacob meets one of the stars of the programmer scene. Anthony Goldblum, founder of the company Kaggle. No one, I, I think, is going to mount an argument today that quality of life is not better because of you know, factory processes and automation. And um, I think in 50, 50 to 100 years' time, like, people will say, be saying the same things about predictive modeling and big data. I like data. I think um, the thing that I really love about data is that it doesn't lie. It's very objective. So, you know, when you, when you ask for somebody's opinion, you get, a, you, get a, you get something back that's subjective. When you ask, when you look at the data and you answer a question with data, you're getting a much clearer, much, much, much more real, much more tangible answer back. There are lots of ambitious young people in San Francisco trying to get rich with predictive analytics. Anthony Goldblum is certainly one of the most successful. We solve problems that I wouldn't have thought were, um, were, were humanly possible to solve using uh, machine learning. So things like grading high school essays using algorithms, um, predicting which drugs are going to be good drugs using algorithms, image detection, machine learning with audio, with financial markets, for instance, starting to do a lot of work in the oil and gas industry. And just things that I never would have thought were possible, the Kaggle community has been able to solve. Kaggle is an online platform that's used by companies like Google, Microsoft, and NASA. They invite programmers from around the world to write the best algorithm for a particular problem. A lot of these statisticians and data scientists are exceptionally brilliant, uh, but no one ever, you know, no one had ever discovered them before. And so Kaggle has given um, people who are previously undiscovered a chance to really become superstars. Nearly 200,000 number crunchers from around the world have already participated in Kaggle competitions, from students to elite professors. 
Pina meets one of those computer whiskets in Hamburg. Josef Feigl ranks among the top 10 of Kaggle programmers worldwide. Towards the end, it's always stressful, mainly because then everybody posts their best solutions and you have to keep up. So that's a bit hectic. But otherwise, it's okay. It's a nice hobby. <laughs> I'd never worked with real data during my studies, and for me, that's the thrill. What's different in real life? During my first competition, I learned much more than during my entire studies. Viel mehr als in der ganzen Diplomarbeit, glaube ich, in meinem Studium. For example, if a pharmaceutical company wants to predict what kinds of people are at risk of contracting diabetes, they start a competition on Kaggle. They provide programmers with anonymous raw data from patients who already have diabetes. You have to think in advance about what data you want to use for your algorithm, and then feed that into the model. This takes up about 80% of the time, and that's the hard part. If you simply feed raw, unprocessed data into an algorithm, then it'll work, but it won't be very good at recognizing patterns. After the algorithm has learned what the typical pattern for a patient looks like, it can then search other people's data for the same pattern. Then it can calculate how likely it is that these people develop diabetes. Josef Feigl sends his calculations to Kaggle and immediately gets feedback on how well his algorithm performs. In the end, an algorithm is only able to calculate probabilities. And even if an algorithm is 97% accurate, its results can be wrong. So you can't eliminate randomness, but you can get increasingly accurate. This is one fundamental limitation of predictive analytics. Even the best algorithm can be wrong. It's not a digital crystal ball. We're quite good at predicting things that happen on a regular basis. But we will never be able to predict singular events. We won't be able to predict the next 9-11 or a suicide or other extraordinary events. This means that Minority Report will remain Hollywood fiction for the time being. People won't be arrested before they've committed a crime. Just because an algorithm has calculated, they will actually do it at some point in the future. There's always a big difference between probability and reality. In individual cases, statistics are useless. The probability of getting a particular form of cancer may be 0 0.0001. But if I get this cancer, statistics won't be much help. It's the same with crime. There's a certain probability that a certain individual will commit a crime in the future. But whether he really will commit a crime is impossible to predict. I think there's, there's fundamentally randomness in the world. Uh, so no matter how much data you collect, if there's a source of randomness, then uh, you won't be able to predict with 100% accuracy. However, even if there isn't a 100% guarantee that someone will commit a crime in the future, the crucial question is, how will society deal with a 95% chance? Is it okay to detain a person, even if it means that we catch somebody totally innocent? In the end, it's a question of ethics. I could just go ahead and arrest people as a precaution. Statistically, that would mean that one in a hundred is locked up for no reason at all. In the US, people are more pragmatic. 
and might say, OK, this is acceptable collateral damage. But in Europe, or at least Germany, they would say, oh no, if only one of these people is innocent, we simply can't do this. Back to our experiment. Now the experts start their analysis. For two months, they've collected Jacobs and Pina's data. The algorithm now searches for recurring events and tries to calculate a prediction. Das sind jetzt die uh, so Business Trips, das heißt, wo, wo Pina mal zu Geschäftszeiten irgendwo deutlich außerhalb war. The irregular lifestyle of our two filmmakers poses a particular challenge. Office workers are more predictable. Another problem is that Jacob and Pina use their smartphones far less than teenagers, for example. Pina just uses her phone very little. Very good for her, but it's much easier to predict a 17-year-old. Totally cryptic, this whole thing. I don't understand what's going on. It needs to be cleaned up. Jacob is still on the road in the US. The most interesting work on predictive analytics is done here in the States. He wants to talk to a programmer who develops algorithms that can predict the outcome of sporting events. Paul Vasir from Cincinnati, Ohio, wants to do the interview via Skype. I predict over 10,000 games every year. I am right about, when we're, when we're factoring in the gambling element of it, I'm right maybe 5,600 times a year. That means I'm wrong 4,400 times a year, but it's also very easy to figure out if I'm better or worse than somebody else because of the quick turnaround, the immediate not just satisfaction, but understanding of whether or not their, their, our, our analysis, our prediction was successful. And every time we get a new piece of data, which happens every single day with almost all of these sports, we can add it to what we're doing and improve the model going forward. Paul Basir makes predictions for hockey games. The algorithm searches historical data for recurring patterns. How do individual players react in certain situations? Which strategy does the manager choose? Hockey is actually the most difficult sport because it's hard to really understand what a play means, right? The actual impact of individual players on, an indi on a given play and understanding just what a play is is very difficult within hockey because it moves at such a fast rate and because the puck never officially starts from one team and goes to the other. It's basically going back and forth. Paul Basir's prediction machine anticipates a game by running 50,000 simulations on all conceivable variants. It does this in real time, even during a game. Sports punters are especially interested in this technology. Paul Basir's website already has more than 10,000 paying subscribers. A success rate of 56% doesn't sound much. It's far away from a safe bet. But for now, it's the most reliable forecast for sporting events. There is a concept that heart and will and uh, some of these other kind of glorified traits that, that some athletes are considered to have in some circumstances versus others is impactful. And maybe it is. Maybe it exists. But that's already in that person. It's very difficult for somebody to immediately and, and quickly have a change of heart or a change of skill or a change of talent. I've worked and looked at, uh, at machines, which you would assume would be far more predictable. And I still feel people are the ultimate machine in terms of being able to understand what they are likely to do when there is a certain objective at hand on the field. Humans as the ultimate machines. Here in Boston, we find a company that claims it can predict not only the fate of individuals or teams, but of whole nations. The Boston Globe calls it the Nostradamus of the digital age. Its investors include Google and the CIA. I'm not sure Nostradamus had any methodology to his workings. You know, we don't know how he did it. Uh, so we believe that we are a bit more scientific. Swedish-born Staffan Truve 
is one of the founders of Recorded Future. He claims to be able to predict riots, wars and revolutions based on information that's floating around the internet. Recorded Future allegedly predicted the overthrow of Egyptian President Morsi in July 2013. Well, at least they knew the trouble was brewing. What happened last year in, in June when Morsi was thrown out as president, we, had, we saw four or five days beforehand that there was something big going to happen. You know, we couldn't know exactly what would happen, you know, and, and it could have backlashed, you know, Morsi could have done something dramatic to, and stayed in power. But at least we saw very clear in our system that, you know, there were very dark clouds in the sky, a little bit into the future. Every day, Recorded Future scours the internet for millions of documents in seven languages. Texts, videos and audio files are searched for specific keywords. The resulting prognoses are sold to all those who don't like surprises. Commercial companies, governments and intelligence agencies. In this case, uh, if you were to do an aggression from Russia on the Ukraine, you would probably do something about the natural gas supply, which is something which you need to, to do beforehand. So reports on something you know, happening to the natural gas supply to the Ukraine would be a possible indicator. Uh, there's also been numerous reports over the years of this motorcycle gang called the Night Wolves, which have some kind of tie to the Russian government. And they were actually seen in the Crimean before the conflict escalated. So there were definitely signals there, you know, and a good analyst would probably be knowing how to look for exactly these signals. Data analysts now do the work of spies and agents. But what's their motivation? World peace? or world domination. They are a bunch of companies trying to essentially get away with making as much money as they can. The state is using them to pursue its own objectives. And that's the reality. Right? You can talk about the internet, big data, algorithms, digitization, deeply alienating effects of all of this. Great, for me, just it's not going to explain 99% of what's happening which revolves around those two simple factors. A, this accompanies B, you have the state actively encouraging them to expand because it suits its own agendas, whether it's fighting terror, or promoting innovation, or you name it. A future without disasters, wars, and epidemics, because we can eliminate problems before they arise, all thanks to computer algorithms. This will remain a dream. Even today, the problem is not a lack of analysis, but a lack of will to act. Back to the fate of the individual. Pina once again meets up with Dr. Schlepfer. What has the depression app found out about her mental state? This shows you the frequency of your phone calls. On Mondays, you make significantly more calls than during the rest of the week. On Sundays, you send virtually no text messages. But on Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays, you send lots of messages. If we look at your mood over the week, you can see that on Sundays, you feel great. And during the eight weeks we monitored you, you consistently felt low on Tuesdays. But that doesn't mean that you suffer from depression. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that Tuesday is my black day. So I make lots of calls early in the week, and then I feel bad. Exactly. We can also say that you're good at managing stress, because your mobile phone behavior doesn't change, depending on how you feel or how stressed you are. This means that you can handle stress well, and that in turn means that the probability of you getting a stress-related disease is rather small. In this case, Pina's quite happy to trust the algorithm's predictions. The trips are coming to an end. Jacob is on his way back home. 
In a few days, the experts will present them with the results of the experiment. For two months, they've been collecting Pina's and Jacob's data. The analysis has taken Georg Fuchs and Alexander Markovets another four weeks. Well, Jacob, you lead a very interesting life. In Jacob's case, the algorithm failed. His lifestyle is simply too unpredictable. The problem was that we couldn't find any patterns during the time we collected your data. A prediction relies on regular patterns. Without them, you simply can't generate meaningful statistics. This means that we had to completely abandon the forecast. This isn't a crystal ball. This is maths. This is statistics, which means we need to have patterns that are present in the data. Jacob did a lot of traveling, so in terms of geography, we couldn't really determine a pattern. But that's fine. Jacob is what we call an outlier in computer science. These are people whose behavior is so unique that they have no similarities with anybody else. They simply stand out. In Pina's data, however, the algorithm was able to find patterns. You weren't an easy candidate either, because you have a completely different lifestyle from a person who works at a bank or keeps regular office hours. You also don't use your phone as much as many other people. But what's really amazing is that we do find solid rhythms and fairly fixed patterns in your weekly routine. At half past eight, you crawl out of bed. At 9.30, you arrive at your office. You're not a vegetarian because you regularly go to a kebab shop. You don't own a car. You work from home a lot. You don't have kids. You go to sleep late, usually at half past midnight. You have a partner who lives with you because your data doesn't show the typical pattern of you sleeping in a second apartment half of the week. Georg Fuchs, a total stranger, now knows more about Pina than some of her closest friends. This amazes me. I wouldn't have thought that I lead such a regular life. I wasn't aware that I have so many set habits. The computer can even calculate a precise forecast for one particular day in Pina's life. The prediction and the entries in Pina's diary are an exact match. By looking at our data, computer analysts can learn as much about us as our closest friends. And this is just the beginning. For me, Silicon Valley is a cult, right? Which operates in its own language, which has its own uh, gods, and which has its own teleology and values. And that cult, you know, was a celebration of disruption has now more or less invaded all the other domains, from education to health to security to crime prevention to, to, to you name it. Many of us embrace this cult, or at least don't see it as something dangerous. But we need to be careful not to trust statistics too much. Algorithms will never be able to predict with 100% certainty whether a child will be successful in school or whether someone will commit a crime in the future. But in the end, the question is not how accurate the algorithms are. The crucial question is how willing we are to trust them and base our decisions on their results.
Die Bedrohungsszenario ist nicht so sehr The threat is an Orwell scenario. It's not so much the spy trying to read my thoughts, trying to find out how subversive I am. The threat is more like Huxley's Brave New World or Kafka's Process. Oder das ist, das ist uh, Kafkas Prozess. In these scenarios, I am controlled simply based on probability. I am told, you are not allowed to enroll in a good school because you're not likely to succeed. And when I question the system, then I'm told, stop doing this or you make yourself even more suspicious. But whether we like it or not, these developments can't be stopped. As so often, it's up to us what we make of it. We're in the process of completely rebuilding society. This is a radical change, for better or for worse. It will be naive to think that we can stop this. The question is, how can we help to shape this vision so that the result is more humane?